بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In our past classes we discussed التوحيد and the last part of it was توحيد الأسماء والصفات Okay Last time we were focusing on the prophethood and how the prophethood plays the role of satellite as nowadays we get satellite we get information from satellite so our satellite in acquiring all the teachings of deen is the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was the last messenger and the last prophet so he was he was having this role jibril comes to him and jibril carries out the message from allah directly and then comes to muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and delivers him the message directly and muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the person a human being who carries out the message to people directly and we explain that people used to depend on their memories and everything of revelation they didn't depend in anything of writing uh, it is on the contrary the society of mecca or the people of mecca the, the in general were not reading or writing they were illiterate and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam saying huwa alladhi ba'atha fil ummiyin rasula minhum in surah al jumu'ah allah is the one who sent or commissioned a messenger of them and describes them being illiterate so then we explained last time i think that the companions or the people who were around muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the messenger used to receive and assimilate everything of what they have of quran they memorize and they were very sharp minded to memorize anything of uh, quran and hearing it once and i think i explained that explicitly and uh, the ummah depended in not on not recording everything in writing there were certain people assigned to be the writers for quran they called them kutabul wahi the clerks or the writers of what is of revelation al wahi means what is inspired or revealed from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through jibril to muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and they used to write these things and everything of what they wrote was preserved and uh, left to, to hafsa the wife of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam daughter of umar and we explained that the quran the first time it started uh, to be reviewed in what is in writing not to review the ayah or no just something of like you are in a house you want to put the chairs in a way this is the review it was not to review anything to see if there is a, a word dropped or a dot added of course there were no dots at that moment 
And the first time we see that the Quran, when was in the process of revelation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it revealed 13 years in Mecca, 10 years in al Medina. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a hikmah that the Quran was not sent in one shot. It was revealed in those 23 years. And uh, the hikmah of what we understand by that is that the Quran should be assimilated and, uh, and uh, applied and in order to do to do that, to make it applica applicable and demonstrated by the society where the Quran revealed in, it gave it time, 23 years. And uh, the mushrikeen used to say this, why don't we have the Quran in one shot, you see? Of course, they were not serious and they wanted to create certain, certain uh, objections against Islam or against the Prophet or against the Quran, whatever you want to say. Anyhow, as I explained, the Quran was the, 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 the prime revelation. And when the Prophet ﷺ died, the first time I said the review of the Quran was taking place during the office of Abu Bakr. And Umar ibn al-Khattab is the one who proposed to take care of having something in writing of the Quran. And uh, this is how Abu Bakr was convinced to do that project. And they uh, organized certain people to be uh, in, in charge of that project. And one of them is Zayd ibn Thabit, as he is a good scholar and uh, a very well knowledgeable person of the Quran and memorization. Uh, of course, those copies, after being rearranged and reviewed, are still kept by Hafsa. During the office of Uthman, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, and the Muslim state is expanding, the expansion of a lot of countries, Islam encroached to those countries, like what happened in Al-Kufa, what happened in and, and al-Basra, what all these are a new location that joined the, the, the uh, map of the Muslim world. Uthman proposed to have some committee. That committee is of the best scholars among the companions of the Prophet وسلم, who are very knowledgeable in, of course, in Arabic language as a language, and in the Quran as it is revealed and how it is arranged. And uh, I'm going to explain certain points here, inshallah. So those a group of scholars or of memorizers made the final agreement on certain official copy. And they wrote six copies, as I remember. One to go to Mecca, one to go to al Medina, one to go to Al-Basra, one to go to Al-Kufa, one to go to Damascus or Syria, Sham, and one to go to Misr, Egypt. <coughs> so those six copies were distributed and Uthman made an ordinance that this is the only copy of the Quran that will be referred to and, and kept uh, as the only version of the Quran Muslims would refer to. 
And of course, it, it was in compliance with different recitations of the Quran, because you see an ayah or a word or whatsoever has some certain uh, recitation, and the recitations were to make it easy for different tribes and clans of Arabs to match with those different recitations because one of the recitations will match with their own dialect or language. So everything of that happened. Now, we see that between the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam until almost the year, the end of the first century of Hijrah, there was no consideration to deal with any collection of hadith. The only popular revelation that is current to people was the Quran. The hadith was re referred to when they come to a question and they don't find the answer in the Quran. And of course, there was no problem of the language. All the problems, if there is any question, goes concerning the application. And this is how some people ask and some companions say, we heard the Prophet Sallallahu does that. We heard the Prophet Sallallahu says that. Early, at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu he didn't allow, he didn't allow people to write hadith. He didn't allow. And he said, anyone who wrote anything of my saying, let him delete it. But he gave permission to very accountable, known persons that they had the permit to write including whom is Abdullah bin Amr ibn al-As. And if you remember, at the time when he was giving the khutbah in his hajj, the, the, the speech of farewell, uh, they call it khutbah al-wada'ah. And uh, he stated certain, what you call it, constitutional laws like in Nadimaakum, Aradakum, Amwalakum, Absharakum, Haramun Alaikum, Kahurmati, Yomikum Hada, Fisharikum Hada, Fi Baladikum Hada. He counted certain things that are holy and should not be offended. Blood, bloodshed, or life, reputation, body. Absharakum, anyone's riches or money or equity, he counted those things as they are sacred and no one can trespass or offend any of those, as I say, constitutional rights related to Muslims or to people. So there was a man, his title or his kunya is Abu Shah. He said, will you, oh messenger of Allah, will you tell somebody to write it for me? He asked this question. He wanted to have it in right. Look, maybe his memory is not uh, that good memory. I don't know why. But the Prophet ﷺ abruptly said, uktubu li Abi Shah, uktubu li Abi Shah. Write for him, write for him. And I think some people volunteered to write him what the Prophet ﷺ said in his speech. So I'd like you to know, until the second century, the first one who moved a step for compiling or putting the narrations of hadith into into some compilation of writing is Umar bin Abdul Aziz during his office. In the year 92 after Hijrah, he sent a circulation to his governors and mayors of the Muslim world saying to them, 
uh, I like you to take care of collecting anything of the narration of hadith to be put in writing. And certain scholars started putting what they got of the hadith into writing. So then you can say it is a hundred years, a hundred years between the Prophet Sallallahu and the first time they started compiling or putting the hadith into writing. The only book was in writing is the Quran. But again, I want you to make sure that you understand what I say. Muslims never depended on what is in writing of the Quran. Because they used to listen to the Salah. There are three times of Salah, Subh and Maghrib al Isha, where the Imam recites Quran loudly. They used to memorize. Maybe recited once, they memorize it. And many of the companions, and if you go back to the history of the prayers of Ramadan at Taraweeh, what they call it, the later generations call it Taraweeh, uh, Umar ibn Khattab was the one who thought of gathering people for one congregation. <coughs> He proposed that there should be an imam who could read for the congregation. And because he is a good memorizer and a good reader, then people are going to focus on the righteous and the, uh, the accurate uh, phonetics and the style of recitation of the Quran. And this is why Umar ordered the 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 best one, according to them, in memorizing and reading Quran, Ubay ibn Ka'b, and Umar ibn Khattab himself didn't join the Salah with the Imam, because he was, according to him, he was very concerned about following the Prophet's method or uh, way that the Prophet Sallallahu stopped the congregation after three days he did it, then he stopped doing it in congregation. Then Umar followed that, up, that approach or that methodology. He used to make salah at home, but let Muslims gather to follow salat Ramadan in the masjid. So then the Quran was publicized and learned and memorized but nothing in writing. Nor was the hadith in writing. And the hadith came as the, the second step in what we have of compiling and collecting of the narrations of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then we have the second century, what is after 100. In the second century, we see that there are certain scholars who focused more than before on, on mentioning and, and reading and writing uh, some of the hadith, including whom is uh, the followers of the companions at Tabi'een. And here started the school of al-hadith but still, it was not taking uh, that fame or that uh, something of a glorious image. Every, everything of focus was on the Quran. Until the, the, the end of the second century, in the second century, since Umar ibn Abdul Aziz made that uh, ordinance of writing hadith. We have some scholars who started writing officially or unofficially. Then the second century, we see the story of Ahmad ibn Hanbal and certain criteria of uh, certain alien thoughts 
emerge in the Muslim Ummah and the first movement which is alien emerged is the phenomenon of Al-Khawarij during in the mid of the first century Ali bin Abi Talib was assassinated in, in 40 after Hijra in the year 40 after Hijra and uh, since after Ali Ibn Abi Talib, the Khalifa, the fourth Khalifa, we see that there are sectarian uh, images seen here and there in the Muslim world. And uh, this movement, uh, by assassinating some people, including whom was Uthman. Uthman was under siege for a month. There are a lot of disturbances took place. Then you remember during Ali bin Abi Talib office, there were many of the companions who were assassinated or killed in the battle of Al-Jamal. And you remember that Talha bin Ubaidillah, Zubair bin Al-Awwam, the two companions of the Prophet ﷺ were killed in Al-Jamal. And no one pays attention for their, for being killed or something like that. As if nothing, as if something easy that could happen in citing Talha throne uh, and his beard is that with dust, is covered with dust. And the same thing happened to Az-Zubair bin Awwam. So all these fit and all these inconveniences took place at that time. Then after, before Ali is assassinated, we know the story of Safin and the dispute between Muawiyah and Ali. Before that, we remember Al-Hassan was elected or was chosen to be the Khalifa, and he gave up the Khalifa to the son of Muawiyah. All these uh, uh, brief uh, reports to enlighten you as we are on the road to go on. So, again I go to Al-Hadith. Al-Hadith, even though it was growing slowly during Malik, during, of course, al-Shafi'i. You know, al-Shafi'i is not a great scholar of hadith, nor is Abu Hanifa. I mean, I don't know what to say. You know, I am, I know I am responsible for every word. In reality, Malik, Malik, was one of the great scholars of hadith. And, but I don't see, I don't see, and I am responsible for what I say now, I don't see anyone who was concerned in the, in the, in the studies of deen and sharia as thorough and articulate as al-Bukhari. Al-Imam al-Bukhari, who is, of course, of the third century, he was one of the prominent scholars. I think, I think he is more advanced than all the scholars of hadith of what I seen in my life. I started studying hadith in 1953, and I'm still a student of hadith as well as of other studies of fiqh and, and, and Quran and sharia. I see an Imam al-Bukhari doesn't have extremity, doesn't have rigidity, and he is of the best scholars in understanding the Qur'an and in interpretation of the ayat of the Qur'an. My sheikh, I say that to you for record, my sheikh 
in 19, I, I remember, 54, he, he used to say, he used to say, any hadith which is not included in al-Bukhari, I don't care about it. I don't think it is important for compiling the hadith for deen. When al-Bukhari doesn't narrate that hadith, it means there is something wrong with narrating it. I did a job. Before I come to the United States, I started that early 70s. And I tried to understand. The Sheikh used to say, any hadith you don't find it in al-Bukhari, don't worry about it. It is not important and it is not, we are not in need of it to be included in the important hadiths for matters of deen or sharia. I didn't accept the Sheikh saying that. I was, you know, I was like Salafi who is uh, very literal Salafi. For example, I used to, in 1957, 58, I used to give strange fatawa. Like I used to say, the government are kuffar. I was in Iraq, I used to say, the government are kuffar. And anything of the money of the government is halal for any Muslim. And some people would go, would go and take the bus and they don't pay for the ticket. And some of them were held in violation that they are not having tickets. And then they make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should punish me or whatsoever of that. Anyhow, I want to say to you this kind of ideology grew up in myself. And it was as a matter of, of ideology uh, I uh, I maybe could have the thoughts of these guys who kill, who uh, stone this or uh, cut the head of that, etc., etc. I could see the legitimacy of what they are doing. But alhamdulillah, uh, the the growth of my experience and and uh, and uh, age makes me review a lot of things. One of them, I wanted to see why Al-Bukhari didn't narrate those hadiths which are narrated exclusively by Muslim, not, not Muslim and Al-Bukhari. And I spent three years to review all these hadiths. I found out, and I say this for record, I found out, you can sit here if you... You've, okay. I, I find out that all the hadiths that are narrated by Muslim exclusively without Al-Bukhari are weak. And Al-Bukhari has a, a clear reason why he didn't narrate that. I was having that in my scripture put in my car when I was in Jared City in 1979. The car was stolen and it was on fire. And that book is gone. Anyhow. So I want to say to you that Al-Imam Ahmed has celebrity and popularity because of, of certain political happenings because he was put in jail, he was tortured, and that gave, gave him a lot of fame. I am not defaming him, but I don't think that he is. When it comes to fiqh, his fiqh will lead into some sort of restrictive fiqh. It has some difficulty. Why? Because the school, the Hanbali school, accepted the Hadith Hassan to be a source of making haram or wajib or anything of aqidah. Okay? Look, for example, the Hanafi school and Maliki school, 
they didn't accept that methodology at all. They don't accept haram the way Ahmed ibn Hanbal accepted. And al-Hadith al-Hasan early used to be da'if. But it is a technique of the scholars who came later. I am coming to that point. Al-Ma'moon as a Khalifa of the mid of the third century was supporter to Al-Mu'tazilites. And he was against Al-Imam Ahmad and he is the one who put him in jail and he is the one who ordered them to be tortured. So when Al-Ma'moon passed away, Al-Mutawakkil came to power in the year 250 something. Al-Ma'moon did something reactionary. In his reaction, he opened the gates for the Sunnah. And everyone who says, I am, I am Muhaddith, I am a scholar of Hadith, I am, I am, they had popularity and they become dominating. All the studies of Sharia ah being Quran, being Hadith, being whatsoever, and the market was for uh, narration. And this is how we see some sort of confusion took place after the mid of the third century. A lot of collections of Hadith are there and you, you hear different names other than the six or seven compilers of hadith. You know the six or seven, Al-Bukhari Muslim, Abu Dawood Al-Tirmidhi, Nasa'i Ibn Majah, and Ahmad. Those are the seven, the most popular collections of hadith. But there are many others who compiled books and their books are there. Uh, Ibn Hibban, Ibn Khuzayma, Ibn Abi Dunya, Al Bazar, etc. All these names didn't have anything to add, as I said, to the skeleton of the narrations needed for Deen. I advise you focus on Al Bukhari, then after you focus on Al Bukhari, go anywhere you want to go. But don't busy yourself with reading different collections and you put it with Al-Bukhari, no. So then we see that a Sunnah grew up and there are a lot of books of Takhreej. Takhreej means to check up the authenticity or non-authenticity of the Hadith and where uh, very well-known scholars who did good jobs, like Al-Iraqi, who, who reviewed Al-Ghazali's book, Ahya Ulum al -Din, and he corrected, explaining if the hadith is authentic or not. And his student, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, was excellent in his books of Takhreej. Takhreej means to clarify Authenticity, uh, authenticity and non-authenticity in his book, Talkhis al-Habir and other books. There are different books for that purpose, but I say later on in the 20th century, uh, Al-Albani came and took, took certain role. Al-Albani is a mutasahil. Mutasahil means easy going. And in 1956, when I met him the first time in summer of 1956, I understood, I met him twice, I understood that he is not highly qualified in the sciences of Arabic language. He's originally Albanian, but he, was, he speaks Arabic fluently. But I mean the classic language of the Quran and of the Hadith, he was not advanced in that field. When I asked some scholars of the University of Damascus, one of them, Rahimahullah Ahmad Ratib al he was of the he was one of the great scholars of Arabic sciences. He said to me, Allah knows, and I am saying that Al Albani 
is not familiar with the Arabic language. So many of his statements in fiqh and in his studies of Arabic language are not, he is not reliable in any of them. In many of them, I'm sorry. And I see the takhrijat to say this is sahih or non sahih. It has something of mess. It has something of mess. And that led him to, found, to find certain canons in saying haram or wajib or etc. because other scholars before him said this hadith is da'if as he comes he says sahih. Then you are going to create some a new criterion for that issue. Uh, of course, I, I, what I noticed in my study as I am dealing with this topic, the Quran is not served very well. I looked at all the books that dealt with Ahkam al-Quran, the laws of Sharia and Deen in the Quran, I don't see the books available and accessible to our hands, did a good job and it is enough for our generation or next generation to be uh, for textbooks or to be uh, reliable for the purpose I talk about. So the Quran didn't have the service and the Hadith depended on depended on uh, a quantitative a qualitative uh, quantitative work but not qualitative work and I want to give you some time for questions I want to conclude saying that uh, the most important study of narrations or a riwaya <laughs> al means narration, and it includes al-hadith, includes a seerah, includes certain aspects, uh, focused on subjectivity in writing the biographies of scholars. And because of that biography, the scholars come and judge if this narrator is of authentic narration or not. Unfortunately, the biography is subjective, not objective, and I can show you many examples for that. Now I'm going to stop at this point because I want to give you some eight, nine minutes for your questions. My question is almost uh, similar to my brother's. I mean, we are following as uh, students um, all those shuyukh or ulama who have approved and who are, you know, following the thoughts or teachings of these big scholars, uh, like the brother mentioned Al Albani. I mean, what is the base for us in order to say? Any brief the differences between Al Albani and the preceding scholars who dealt with reporting authenticity and non-authenticity of hadiths? There is a big gap, and the big gap could seen when you are a student following up. I am talking as a person who followed up from 53 until this moment. I have no business other than study and read and review things. So my conclusion, my conclusion is an opinion. Are you with me? I didn't say it is Dean. I didn't say it is Quran, I didn't say it is Hadith, it's an opinion. I am a teacher, I should expose what I have found out in my research and in my study. I offer that and expose everything of that. Uh, you mentioned that the Ma'moon back up the Mu'tazila. How they were different than the rest? Oh, Al-Mu'tazila, Al-Mu'tazila, Al-Mu'tazila then, they used to say the Qur'an is makhluq. All other Muslim scholars disagreed with that and say it is Kalamullah, and Kalamullah is similar to Sifatihi. And Sifatullah cannot be created, cannot be creatures. It is a part 
of his entity. You cannot separate the speech of Allah from Allah himself. So Allah himself, you cannot say anything of Allah's sifat or, uh, or nouns could be a creature. That was the main point. And there the are a lot of details. Huh? The rest, they were just regular Sunni Muslims. Yeah, they are Muslims. Of course, the Imam is the Makhshari, is Hanafi, Kashaf, yeah. is a follower of the Hanafi school. Barakallah. Anyhow, uh, I, I am very happy that Allah gave me time and age to, to discuss this. I know I, it's a, a shot, but I tried not to overdose it. But the best challenge to me or to anybody is to go and read and find out something. You come to me and say, Sheikh, I read something. Yes. May Allah bless you and we should go to Salah. Thank you.